Well, once again, happy 4th of July. We know this is Independence Day. Happy 4th of July, everybody on Zoom. Linda, it's good to see you. This is the day we celebrate our independence when we formally became the United States of America in what year? 17, come on, 1776. That was quite a long time ago. But it's an important date in our history. There are many countries who celebrate independence days. After our 200, out of uh, 225 countries, 163 of them celebrate an independence day. So independence is important. We want independence. Our church is independent. It means that there can be a lot more work. We struggle financially because we are an independent church. Uh, technology is a continuing issue. However, we seek independence. Because through independence, we find more equality. And here we are, back in a room, just like we were when we first started years and years ago. You know, we will look around and see if we can find a better fit, because we're a little, there's too many of us in here, right? But that's a very good problem. Since the beginning of time, people have fought and worked diligently to find freedom. People fight for freedom. People have that inner need, that inner drive to do almost absolutely anything to achieve freedom. People want freedom as a country from oppression, discrimination, marginalization. We want freedom from racism, from slavery. And it's critical to realize that as we fight for ourselves and for all of those people who have no way to defend themselves, it's important that we fight, that we work hard, that we seek spiritual freedom as well. Does this sound a little confusing? Well, let me unpack this a little bit. You know, we fight for physical freedom. Most definitely that is critical, but spiritual freedom is equally as important. So I want to read from the book of Romans. Chapter 7, verses 15 through 25a, which means the first uh, phrase in uh, uh, verse number 25. So in verse 15, Paul is writing. Remember, uh, Pastor Noah explained to us that Paul sent letters of admonishment to different churches, churches teaching them what they needed to do. Well, in this letter, Paul has written, and in verse 15 it says, it's very powerful. He says, I do, under, do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. It's pretty powerful. Sound familiar, eh? We've got a name for this dilemma. It's called the conflict of two natures. The good and the bad, the good and bad angel on your shoulder, right? So we typically have two natures within us. So this dilemma is called the conflict of two natures. It's a conflict between our old nature and our new nature. The old nature is our nature before we came to know Jesus Christ. It's the old us, so to speak. The new nature is our transformation that we undergo once we accept Jesus as our Savior, we change into a new nature. So the new nature is here with all of you right now. All of you here are living within the new nature. You all know the difference between right and wrong. I like what the pastor of the Lutheran Church, what she, uh, they told me this morning. <laughs> they said that, COVID had really impacted their congregation, and they were in a rebuilding phase, same as we are. <clears throat> Membership has dwindled, people have left the church for different reasons, and this Lutheran church experienced the same thing. And he said that part of his sermon today was that it's a choice. People choose not to be involved in church due to COVID, 
is because they have made that choice. And I liked that perspective. So the two natures allow us to know the difference between right and wrong, mostly. The new nature says, well, you know, I'm not going to cuss anymore. And then five minutes later, here we are cussing up a blue streak. Even though we've made that commitment to stop swearing, and then right out of my mouth comes a cuss word. Well, that's due to the old nature that takes over and kind of pushes that new nature aside. Maybe you're trying to stop um, having tantrums or angry outbursts. <coughs> something that you don't want to do and you are resolved to stop doing this and then before you know it you have slipped back into that old behavior it's so very odd because we tend to vacillate back and forth between our old nature and our new nature and that's what's called the dilemma of the conflict of two natures and it's very frustrating of us how many of y'all have that kind of a problem raise your hand Come on, be honest. Everybody's hands should be up. Y'all should know what I'm talking about. Because we've all got those two natures within us. Sometimes I do things that I don't want to do, and it confuses me. I feel like I'm ready just to throw this old nature right out the window and close it tight. And then somehow the window opens and it comes back in again. And then I go ahead and do the thing that I vowed I would no longer do. And it's like, it's not my, it's not what I want to do, but it's like being in a room with someone who just makes me crazy. <laughs> and I tell myself, no, you will not do this. And then I start to get angry, and then I start to lash out verbally. But you know, I cannot blame the person that, that makes me react like that, because it's my choice. I can choose to control myself, or I can just give in to the old nature and cuss them out. Well, no, I wouldn't cuss them out, but, but you know, I can do my thing, so to speak. I feel like sometimes my old nature supersedes my new nature. And I want it to be the other way around. I want the new nature to supersede the old, but that doesn't always stay that way. The old nature has a powerful control and a powerful influence on my decisions, and I do want to change that. But the fact of life is that this will be a lifelong battle. However, we should be able to get better and better <coughs> and better, and it will become easier and easier to not fall into the trap of the old nature. As you spiritually grow, it will get easier. In verse 16, Paul says, I mean, we can't really put ourselves in Paul's shoes, but try to imagine the first century. Imagine Paul's life during that time. And Paul is writing. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. This is kind of important. I'm really happy and very, very thankful for this verse. Because remember, it's the 613 rules and commandments that uh, the Jewish religion goes through. The Jews in Israel have to follow all of those different requirements. And then finally, Moses went to the mountain and got the Ten Commandments. There were just five on each tablet. And then Jesus said, well, the there, we're going to boil it down to two, and the most important are love God and love people. So we went from 613 to 10 to two. And a lot of churches say that the law is insignificant. We don't need to, to pay any attention to it. We don't need to use it for us. However, that's not true. The law has been reduced. It has not been eradicated we still need to satisfy the tenets of the law. And Paul says that I agree that the law is good. There are some theolog theologians who think that Paul is actually struggling with coveting or covetousness. 
He sees things that he wants. Some people, theologians, feel like that's what he, was his uh, struggle. It doesn't matter what it was. We all struggle with something. So Paul says, I think the law is good. Because if I did not have the law, I would not know that coveting is wrong. And that's why it's so important that we do not dis the Old Testament. We need to read and see what it is that God wants, what God does not want, what God likes, what God does not like. So we have to read the book from beginning to the end. And I, it doesn't mean we have to understand everything fully. I don't understand everything fully. But we do know that God hates murder. However, but do you know all that murder means? Because Jesus said, Murder doesn't mean just killing. It means resenting or hating someone. But that is also a form of murder. And if we did not have God's word, we would not know that, and we would not know what to do. You know the Bible says, do not commit adultery. And Jesus takes that a little further and says, adultery means that when you look at someone with lust, that is equivalent to committing adultery. So if we did not have the laws, we would not know. So Paul is writing, I'm glad that I know, because I do have the laws. Paul, Paul is Jewish. He says, I am so glad that I have the law, because if I did not know the law, then I would not know right from wrong. So in verse 17, he goes on to say, it is no more my, myself who is acting, but it is sin that is acting within me. Because he had a new nature. He was a new creation. He has accepted Jesus. He was a follower of Jesus. He knew the difference between right and wrong, but the sin was still getting into him. And that's what was doing what he did not want to do any longer. It was sin working through him. So I thought that was kind of cool. So the new nature becomes our I, but the old nature is still there somewhere within our personalities. In verse 18, Paul goes on to say, For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. That's really kind of sad. That's a, that's a sad struggle, right? Now, are y'all confused yet? You know, Paul is saying, well, I want to do this, and I know what's right, but I don't always do it, and I want to do what I want to do, but I can't do what I want to do. So anyway, our, in our nurture, in old nature, we will find nothing good. There's nothing good in our old nature, and that's why we need a Messiah. That's why we have to grow old and die someday. <coughs> Age and death is a consequence of our sin. And that's just the way it is. We can't avoid it. We're all going to age. We're all going to die. But once we accept Jesus as our Messiah, then the new nature starts to take effect. And we learn how to live in the right manner. And we can look forward to eternal life in heaven. And we can enjoy the journey of learning and growing spiritually, mentally, physically, emotionally. It's all encompassed in this new nature. And it all can grow and flourish. Our new nature hates sin. And so when we do wrong, that's why we feel so disgusted with ourselves. Because we have our Savior living within us. And so we abhor sin, but we have the old nature in here too, so we keep sinning. I hope that makes sense. I hope it's not too confusing to everybody. So the dilemma is, once we become born again, we do receive the new nature. And we strive to suppress the old nature on our own. And that is a huge and gigantic mistake. 
You know, when we're born from God, we absolutely have to rely on God alone, listen to God alone, and follow the Lord's guidance. We have to pray to God. We have to. That's an imperative. And that's also a dilemma because we don't do that, right? We don't always totally rely on God. We really don't. I mean, we should. We should always try to rely on God completely, but we don't do that. In the beginning, we can be, after we're new Christians, we've just accepted Christ, maybe we've been back to eyes, we're full of excitement and zeal, but before long, we're back to our old ways. And it can be really hard to put that old nature aside on our own. So we say, okay, God, yeah, I know, I'm going to see God on Sunday mornings. That's probably enough, right? Well, it's not. You know, if we think that we can overcome and manage our addictions, our bad habits, our anger, our anxiety, our depression, our marriage issues, our busy schedules, our financial budgeting, our parenting issues, if we think we can take care of all that on our own, we absolutely can not. We cannot manage those issues without God being central. 100% of the time, every day, all day long. And that's a fact. Wouldn't you agree? We have to have God at the center. I mean, we try to move along without it. Good grief of Paul, who has written so many letters, cannot do anything on his own. There's no way we can. We can only accomplish our goals through Christ, who gives us strength. And we don't depend on Christ. We continue to try and depend on ourselves, and we continue to war with the old nature as we seek freedom from bondage and <laughs> sin. Remember, salvation doesn't mean that, um, doesn't just apply to eternal life. Salvation applies right here to this earthly life, to allow God to, to lead us, to protect us, to teach us to help us overcome life's difficulties. Because <clears throat> life has lots of really tough problems. In verse 19, it goes on to say, I do not do the good that I want to do, but the evil that I do not want to do is what I do. And once again, Paul's heart is broken over this. Poor Paul, poor us. I mean, how many times do we say the same exact thing? We say, I did it again. Arg! And Paul, you know, Paul is known as Saint Paul. He is a legitimate saint. You know, anyone who dies for Christ can become a saint. And he became a saint in 66 AD when the Romans beheaded him. Paul was renowned, and he had to work on his own nature daily, not just on Sundays, not just on the Sabbath. He worked on his nature every single day. He prayed, he served, he sacrificed, he struggled. And that means it's even more important for us to stay connected to the church. In verse 20 and 21, it says, Now, if I do what I do not want to do, then that is no more me doing it, but sin living within me, taking action. So I find, I find, or feel that the law is at work within me, the things that I want to do, I want to do well, and I want to do good, but the enemy is right there with me at the same time. So you can see, Paul is writing handedly about his struggles, and he is reiterating his struggles, because he struggled just as we struggle now. We're not bad Christians because we struggle. We're not lousy Christians. Good grief, this is St. Paul who was struggling. 
and struggling continually with his dual nature, with his humanity. And I don't mean to use that as an excuse. We can't say, oh, well, you know, I'm human. That's not the intent of this at all. However, we are human, but it also means that we've got a dual nature going on within us. It's there all the time. The old and the new are in constant battle, in spiritual warfare. You know, as I, we read what Paul wrote, I just get really sad for him, but then I also realize that he and I are exactly the same. And I think it's important that he wants you to know this, and I want you to know this, that Paul is very, very comfortable writing these verses for each and every one of us here, for you and I to see that, you know, we are struggling, but we're okay. We are okay. I want to say this again. We are okay. We can feel mad, we can feel angry, we can feel sorrow, we can feel depressed, we can feel lonesome. Even if we're married, we can feel lonesome. We can feel frustration. We can have problems with addictions, with bad habits. And Paul wrote this. And I am so thankful that we have this scripture. Because sometimes when we are struggling, we have this internal battle going on between our own sinful self. We don't feel as if we're being good Christians. And we start to wonder, what is wrong with us? We start to think, what? I did it again. And especially as a pastor, it really affects me. And then Paul was a pastor, and here he is writing this. Because as a pastor, we are expected to be perfect. 100% of the time, and that's impossible because our old natures are dwelling within us, struggling with our new natures. And Paul knew this struggle, and he says, it's okay. And here we are, 2,000 years after Paul penned this, struggling with the exact same issues. <laughs> then in verses 22 through 24, Paul writes again, my inner self is excited to know God's law, but I see another law working within me that is in conflict and I'm struggling against the law of my mind and making me enslaved and imprisoned to the law of sin that is working within me. Paul says, oh, oh, oh. I am such a very bad guy. Who will save me from myself, from this body that is subjugated under death? This is Paul crying out. Were you guys familiar with this ver these verses before? This is just really sad. St. Paul, who was a martyr for Jesus, who sacrificed his life to serve to endure imprisonment, to suffer, to starve, to thirst, and who experienced loneliness. And he was in an underground cell that was bitterly cold. He is writing that he is a terrible, atrocious person. Paul was tired. And this is a beautiful example of what normal spiritual warfare looks like. So you all go ahead and think about your spiritual warfare compared to Paul's. Go ahead and think about it, and then you'll realize that what you are going through is normal. And yes, you do need to serve, you need to sacrifice, you need to support the church, you need to support each other. You need to love God first and love other people. You need to forgive other people. And you need to forgive yourself. If you don't forgive yourself, you are unable to forgive anyone else. Don't fool yourself about that. You need to forgive your, yourself first if you really want to forgive other people. So go ahead and think about what Paul was going through and then what you're going through and see the similarities. And then think about, you know, as maybe you're not as bad as you thought. Maybe I'm not as bad as I thought. 
maybe I'm normal. Now I know that every human being struggles. You all and I struggle. Sometimes life gives us gigantic challenges. Sometimes the challenges are not so bad, but sometimes they're huge. It would be so nice if we could all just judge things, but we can't. We need to be praying for each other because, you know, we're all going through the exact same type of struggles as long as we are living. We will have similar life issues. I want us all to read uh, Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, and I want us to say it together. So sign with me one time, and then I want you to remember what this verse means. This is from Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. Are you ready? I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. Ready? Let's do it again. I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. <clears throat> and I would like to close with a poem, a quote from Mother Teresa. She was an incredible woman. You know, I don't want any of you to put limitations on yourself. I want you to be able to learn from a variety of different leaders. Do you understand that? I don't want you to think, oh, I can't read something from Mother Teresa because she's Catholic. Or I can't read them from this um, theologian because they're Lutheran. Put those ideas right out the window. This has, those, that type of thinking has no place at Deaf International Community Church. We are not the only ones going to heaven. We don't teach that. We don't teach that we're right and they're wrong or they're right and we're wrong. No. The whole thing is about the heart. God knows what's in our hearts. So here's a quote from Mother Teresa that's truly astounding. I mean, she was a, a exemplary servant of God. And she said, life is an opportunity. Benefit from it. Life is beauty. Admire it. Life is a dream. Realize it. Life is a challenge. Meet it. Life is a duty. Complete it. Life is a game. Play it. Life is a promise. Fulfill it. Life is sorrow. Overcome it. Life is a song. Sing it. Life is a struggle. Accept it. Life is a tragedy. Confront it. Life is an adventure. Dare it. Life is luck that you make it. Life is so very precious. Do not destroy it. Life is life. Fight for it. Amen. Amen. Hey guys, today is the first Sunday.